He's coming from Paris. He's internationally known for uh, the hypertension, the pulmonary hypertension topic. So I'm not going to, to say anything about him. <laughs> Thank you very much for the nice introduction. I'm delighted to be here for the joint uh, meeting between respiratory and cardiology uh, doctors. And as you may know, and as you can read here, these guidelines are joint guidelines between European Society of Cardiology and European Respiratory Society. Uh, these are my disclosures. And uh, the task force was very well balanced between members from the ESC background and members from the ERS background. Our friend and colleague Nazareno Gallier was chairing the ESC part and I was chairing the uh, ERS part, but we were working very closely together. And among the task force members, there were representatives for many societies, including cardiology and respiratory societies. So to start with a condition like pulmonary hypertension, we have to start with definitions, of course, and uh, the definition has not changed, but should be uh, very well uh, emphasized. Uh, pulmonary hypertension is defined by means of invasive measures of uh, mean pulmonary artery pressure above or equal 25 minute, uh, millimeter of mercury. So this is a definition. Of course, you have non-invasive assessments, but if you want a robust definition, 25 is the number, and it's mean, not systolic, of course. Uh, another important point as, at this stage is to say that uh, we have uh, a normal value of mean PAP, which is 14 millimeter of mercury, and a standard deviation, which is 3 millimeter of mercury. So between 14 and twice the standard deviation, you have a normal value. So 14 plus 6, 20. So between 21 and 25, there is a gray zone, borderline values, which are not uh, defining pulmonary hypertension, but which should be known as possibly abnormal. So then when you deal with pulmonary hypertension, you deal with pre- and post-capillary pulmonary hypertension, as emphasized in all textbooks. And for a wedge pressure below or equal 15, we deal with pre-capillary pulmonary hypertension. And in that category, you have PAH, formerly known as primary pulmonary hypertension, idiopathic, uh, PH due to chronic lung diseases and or hypoxia, chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, and pulmonary hypertension with unclear or multifactorial mechanisms. Then you have the post-capillary pulmonary hypertension, which is very, very common, of course, and which is defined by a mean above 25 and a wedge above 15. And then we have discussed with our cardiology colleagues how to define better the patients with real <coughs> passive isolated post-capillary pH versus those with a pre-capillary flavor. And in fact, it is certainly work in progress, but right now we define isolated post-capillary hypertension as patients with PVR below three wood units and diastolic pulmonary gradient below seven millimeters of mercury. When you don't have these two parameters in, the, in this range, you have certainly uh, in front of you a patient with some kind of combined post and pre-capillary pulmonary hypertension. I must, however, emphasize that this is work in progress, and I think at the next um, guideline committee, there will be a, a refinement to establish. After defining the condition, you have to classify <clears throat> the condition, and pulmonary hypertension is not a disease. Uh, it's a group of disease characterized by raised pressure in the pulmonary vascular bed. So we have done, a, I think, a good job, uh, since many years, uh, in defining patients according to common pathomechanisms and common uh, management. And for example, group 1 pH is characterized by remodeling of the small pulmonary arteries. It can occur without any cause or with heritable causes, gene mutations, or with associated conditions like scleroderma, portal hypertension, HIV infection, and congenital heart disease. Schistosomiasis is, is common in Latin America, Brazil mostly, but all these patients, despite the different background, have in common remodeling of the small pulmonary arteries. Very close to them, you have patients with remodeling predominating in the veins. This is a very strong aspect of my research group, but it is very, very rare with a prevalence around one per million uh, in France, and this has a prevalence around 25 per million. 
Then you have the very, very common diseases, pulmonary hypertension due to left heart disease with left ventricular systolic dysfunction, diastolic dysfunction, valvular heart disease, and other uh, congenital heart disease. So this is common. This is very common in cardiology setting, and even in pneumology setting, uh, we always have to bear in mind that this is a very common cause of pulmonary hypertension. When you deal with group 1 pH, you have, of course, the congenital heart disease, which are extremely important and which should be subclassified into Eisenmenger syndrome, pH associated with prevalent systemic to pulmonary shunts, correctable or non-correctable, patients with a small co coincidental defect, and pH occurring after correction. This is, of course, a subspecialist uh, issue, but this is quite important. It's not that simple, patients with congenital heart disease. Then you have the respiratory diseases, very common for pulmonologists, COPD, uh, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, etc. Then you have a very important sub-cause, which is chronic thrombolytic pulmonary hypertension, which is a curable cause of uh, pulmonary hypertension. It can be cured by surgery, but now more and more by balloon pulmonary angioplasty for people who are not surgical candidates. And then you have uh, several other causes which are too rare and too complex to be discussed today. So when you have a patient with a definition, when you have classified the patient in group 1 PAH, you may be, of course, tempted and you have to consider management. And uh, to consider management in the best setting, it's like pulmonary embolism. You have to establish the risk. Risk assessment is key uh, in the initial approach of patients with uh, PAH. And we have done uh, once again, work is in progress, but we have done a first attempt based on literature and expert opinion to subclassify patients into low risk, intermediate risk, and high risk uh, PAH. Of course, here I discuss PAH, so patients who may be candidate for innovative therapies such as endothelin receptor antagonists, PD5 inhibitors, guanolite cyclase stimulators, and prostacycline derivatives. So low risk means a risk of death less than 5% at one year, so it's not zero. Intermediate risk, 5 to 10, and high risk, more than 10. And of course, what matters very much in this risk assessment is the evidence of uh, right heart dysfunction. So you have clinical signs of right heart dysfunction, you have anti-proBNP levels, you have imaging, and you have hemodynamics. Of course, I'm, I have no time in 17 minutes to discuss everything in great detail, but bear in mind that this is expert opinion, and it will help you to uh, manage the patient. A patient in the red zone should be treated aggressively and considered for transplantation if needed. Uh, and patients with low risk can be uh, managed, of course, urgently too, but in a more um, progressive fashion. So it is really recommended, it's expert opinion, but high class of recommendation. It is recommended to evaluate the severity of pH patients with a panel of data derived from clinical assessment exercise test, biochemical markers, echocardiographic and hemodynamic evaluations, and you don't do it only once, you do it every th three to six months in stable patients and more often in um, non-stable patients. What is really important is that achievement and maintenance of a low risk profile, the green zone, is recommended as an adequate treatment response for patients with pH, and achievement maintenance of an intermediate risk profile is not considered as adequate treatment response by uh, the experts. And this is something we have emphasized, also, although the class of recommendation is lower, of course. So let's treat the patient. So the patient first is treatment naive. First time uh, you see the patient in the community and in your expert center. So pH is confirmed by an expert center. It's not uh, regular cardiology or pneumology management. It should be done in uh, centers with high flow uh, of patients. High flow being, of course, different according to the country size. But uh, it's important to have sufficient flow to establish expertise. So then you will propose general measures, supportive therapies. You will do an acute vasoreactivity test. So general measures, I'm not going to list them all, but ladies should not be pregnant. That's a pity, but it's very important. Uh, the patient should be vaccinated. Uh, psychosocial support should be recommended. And supervised exercise training should be considered only in physically deconditioned patients under medical therapy. So we don't do it in isolation. 
So oxygen in the plane, if elective surgery is discussed, it should be done in an expert center with um, epidural rather than general anesthesia, and exercise physical activity is not advised. Then we have the supportive therapies, diuretics for patients with right ventricle failure and fluid retention, oxygen if there is hypoxia or hypoxemia, oral anticoagulant is less and less recommended, but it should be considered in patients with high pH, irritable pH and pH due to anorexigen with an INR ranging from 1.5 to 2.5. We recommend to correct anemia to, to uh, check iron status, and we do not recommend beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, etc., in pH patients. So then the patient uh, may be considered for calcium channel blocker therapy, but only if they do acutely respond to vasodilator challenge. We don't test calcium channel blocker, we test nitric oxide in a center with expertise, which does at least 20 tests per year. The patients who do respond, may res who do respond to NO, may respond to long-term CCB in 50% of cases only. So when you start CCB therapy, the patient should be followed very carefully. Then you have the patients who are non-vasoreactive, 95% of patients, and then the risk assessment is paramount. Either the patient has high risk or low intermediate risk. If he has high risk, it's the kingdom of early combination therapy, including intravenous prostacycline. If the patient is low or intermediate risk, you have the choice between initial monotherapy or initial duo uh, oral combination therapy. I will discuss that in detail this afternoon. It's too long to be discussed in two minutes. But you have a choice uh, for intermediate risk, either initial combo or initial mono, but you have to do it, do it right meaning that you have to follow these patients carefully and to um, risk assess them every three to six months. So now you have a patient who is already treated, so patient already on treatment, and you will assess the clinical response. And for the patients who have no good treatment response, you will certainly consider sequential combination therapy Another important point is that if they are eligible for transplantation, they may be considered for a lung transplantation, maybe not listed, but at least considered, because lack of initial response is a marker of future difficulties. Then we will do double or triple combination therapy, and lung transplantation will be recommended soon after inadequate clinical response on maximum medical therapy in eligible patients. So a few words on group two, group three, group four before closing. Okay, so group two is common, and you all know better than I do, certainly. So you have the clinical presentation, which may be uh, evocative of uh, um, group two pH, the age, symptoms, symptoms of left heart failure, features of metabolic syndrome, history of heart disease, and persistent AF. And ECHO will show you large left atrium and left ventricular dysfunction, and other features such as ECG or imaging parameters will be evocative. What is really important is that pH group two is not the kingdom of PAH therapy. The, um, the use of PH approved therapies is not recommended for PH LHD. So if you have left heart disease and you want to give uh, a drug approved for PH, it should be in the setting of a randomized control trial. Then group two, group three uh, PH, so the patients with lung disease, either they have um, uh, severe pH with a mean PAP above 35 or 25 with a low cardiac index. And in that case, similarly, we do not recommend uh, pH therapy, but the patients may be considered for treatment in a randomized control trial or in a registry. Last but not least, CTEF, chronic thromboembolic hypertension. You know that a screening tool of great importance is ventilation perfusion lung scan, which performs much better than a CT scan. And for screening, you have VQ lung scan. If CTEF is possible, segmental defect, you will refer to a center with expertise in CTEF management. They will do the imaging, they will do the angio, they will do the right at cath, and they will discuss the management with either targeted medical therapy 
for those who are not candidate for surgery, surgery for the vast majority of people with proximal disease, and BPA in expert centers, so balloon pulmonary angioplasty. We do not recommend for CTF um, uh, screening in patients who have survived PE if they are not short of breath. Okay, so we don't do systematic PE uh, screening. So referral center, it depends on the country. I know I speak today in Switzerland, but in a, in a country like, uh, like France, a referral center should follow at least 50 patients with PH or CTF, and these patients, uh, these centers should do at least 20 vasoreactivity tests, and all referral centers should be able to do phase two, phase three clinical trials. So I don't know if I have one minute to close or yes. So the 10 commandments, I was asked by ESC and ERS with Nazareno Gallier to write the 10 commandments. It's very good to close. So first, right heart catheterization is recommended to confirm the diagnosis of PAH and support treatment decision. Second, vasoreactivity testing performed during right heart catheterization is recommended in patients with idiopathic, irritable, and drug-induced PAH. And if they do respond, they are candidate for calcium channel blocker therapy. If not, they are not candidate. You have to evaluate severity, risk assessment, as I did show. Ladies should not be pregnant. And uh, if you have uh, a patient with PH, he or she should be uh, seen in a center with multi-professional teams. Uh, initial drug monotherapy or initial drug combination therapy is possible in treatment naive, low or intermediate risk. Sequential drug combination is recommended in pH patients with inadequate treatment response to initial mono or dual combination. And initial combination is recommended in the most severe patients, including an IV prostacycline. The use of pH-approved therapies is not recommended in patients with left heart disease or lung disease, and surgical endotectomy is a treatment of choice for CTEF, and other drug, drug treatment and other BPA approaches are emerging. Thank you very much.